Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gizela Kay, and in this video, I'm offering you the replay segments from the closing arguments, which were so powerful. I hope that you will check them out if you haven't seen them before. The live stream is still busy processing, and the audio and video was a little bit out of sync, so I thought I would make this video for you so that I could synchronize it before that gets synchronized. So, closing arguments will be in this video. Then, the verdict. The jury took 10 hours to deliberate and they came back with a recommendation of life without parole, which I actually think for someone like Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, as much as many people were hoping that he would get the death penalty, I'm thinking for a personality type like him, life without parole could be worse. There's an entire hierarchy there. It's as if he would have now lost complete control. I feel like if he went on death row, because he would be quite isolated, you know, I think he would feel a sense of control because we know that the death penalty takes a very long time until someone actually gets executed. On average, 15 years, sometimes up to 29 years. And yes, they're isolated. They can't see their family. They would be behind, you know, a glass uh, wall if they if their family did visit them and things like that. They get a little bit more commissary, I believe, uh, on death row as well. And also, people in the chat throughout this trial said that an inmate on death row costs the, the country a lot more than someone in gen pop. So I'm thinking that this is probably a better outcome also for the family because of that whole appeals process. I mean, that is re-traumatizing, draining, extremely sad. So at least they don't have to go through that. Um, so I'm sure there will still be appeals and things, but it's not the same as someone being on death row. I mean, that process is, as I say, all the things I just said, re-traumatizing and sad and draining and all of that. So, yes, we've got the closing arguments, the verdict, we've got the sentencing and the victim impact statements in this video. If you look at the pinned comments or in the description box, there will be timestamps for you. So if you've already seen, for example, the closing arguments and you're like, I don't want to watch it again, just skip skip to the next part just click on that timestamp and go and watch what you haven't seen yet this will also help those of you who are trying to watch the replay of the live stream we had earlier where we saw those closing arguments together because sometimes here and there youtube messes up a little bit and they are still processing that live stream and right now the audio and the video is not synced and that's just terrible to watch i mean we apply the grizzly boost so that we get the best sound and we make sure we get the best visuals and everything and then right now youtube just messed up the live stream replay so i'm very sorry about that i hope it will sort itself out eventually but this will help you be able to re-watch the closing arguments with good volume and the picture and the everything if you see chat messages and so on popping up don't worry that's from the live stream replay i'm just putting this in here for you so that you can actually watch it as if you were there with us so to all of you who subscribed during this trial thank you so much shout out to laredo texas a lot of locals from laredo texas have recently subscribed to the channel thank you so so much for all your emails for all your feedback for your input and everything i really hope that you will stick around if you haven't yet subscribed do so hit the bell as well set it to all so you don't miss out on the next live stream or video or premiere or community post or short or whatever i make for you i am always making content for you on this channel uh, this channel is just over two years old now. My name is Gisela Kay. I am South African. If you're wondering where is this lady from, I'm South African living in the Netherlands with my Swiss husband and our black cat Fury. You oftentimes will see Fury, especially if you look at the, the live stream replays, for example, in the trial. Some timestamps even include Fury says hi because he said hi to us a lot throughout this trial. He was very curious and because I spent many hours here in my studio, he pops in and out to visit us. So... Yes, so thank you so much um, to everyone who's new. I hope that you will stay with us to watch more trials, to follow more cases. I'm currently going to be following the Long Island serial killer case. There's trials coming up as well. I'm very excited to see the, the Coburger trial as well. Let's see if that happens in October or not. But there are trials that I will be covering before then. So if you like this format, if you like presentations and deep dives and map time and snarky time where appropriate and... All of the things that you've already had a preview of, if you are new here, then I will see you in the next case coverage. Mostly, I just want to, I want to send so much love to Griselda and Dominique's family. They have been so strong throughout this trial. I admire them so much. They have really been resilient. They waited 
for f more than five years to get to this point of the trial for justice for Griselda and Dominic. Griselda and Dominic were murdered on April 9th of 2018 by a former Border Patrol supervisory officer. And Griselda was an ex-girlfriend of Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles. And all she wanted was some help with child support for their son because Ronald got her pregnant and she wanted some help to take care of him for daycare, you know, the usual bills and things. She was pursuing a nursing career and he decided that he was not going to deal with that. And on March 25th of 2018, he already tried to off Dominic. He injected something into his leg. Now, we don't know from this whole trial. We were hoping that we'd find out what that exactly was. We don't know exactly what that was. They said they don't want to destroy the tissue sample that they do have. And they think it would take more than a thousand tests to figure out exactly what it is. So until they know um, a narrower search of what that actually was, they haven't you know, been able to test for what he was injected with. But that was on March 25th, 2018. And then on April 9th of 2018, Burgos lured Griselda to the Father Charles Macnabo Park. And when she got there, she borrowed her sister's car and parked. He got her somehow to walk towards him on trails, walking trails into kind of the bush. To me, it looks like almost like the Kruger National Park. If you are from South Africa, you'll understand. But it's like a very like brushy, bushy area, right? And she walked in there with Dominic in the stroller. He was hiding in the bushes. Um, that's what the prosecutor said. And he ambushed them. And he stabbed Griselda 27 times. And Dominic twice. And it is interesting that Griselda was 27 years old. And he stabbed her 27 times. And Dominic was um, 18 months old. And he stabbed him twice. It was absolutely horrendous what he did. So, life without parole. He's going to his forever home as we speak. He's busy packing his things. And he was already unhappy going from one cell to another in the Webb County Jail when the jury found him guilty in the first phase of this trial. So I can't imagine right now how he's kicking and screaming of like, I don't want to move. <laughs> You're gonna. You're going to your forever home now. And he'll be in the general population, but there's a whole tier a ranking system there where he's going to be at the g3 level which is anyone who is a sentence of 50 years or more so 50 plus years and including life without parole if he when he gets there he'll get a really thick uh, rule book and if he violates any of those rules then they'll put him in g4 or g5 and then he gets less and less privileges so yes he might get a tablet can't believe they get tablets in prison these days but yeah he might get a tablet, he'll be able to get commissary, he'll be able to eventually get a job in the prison, work his way up, maybe work in the kitchen, who knows, and play checkers and chess outside and have some rec time and all of that. And while that all sounds, you know, it sounds almost like a resort, some people are saying, it's really, I think the reality is very scary. I mean, the people that are in there and the hierarchy that exists in there with all the cliques and the gangs and everything... Oh, it's not going to be fun for Burgos. So, okay. I'm now going to play that those videos for you. The replays of the closing arguments, the verdict, the sentencing, and the victim impact statements. And I will see you in the next one. Stay safe. Please note that this content is for adults only, viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Good morning. In nine days, July the 26th, it will be Dominic's birthday. He will be turning seven. And like many Texans, and like many Laredoans, the Hernandez family will go to his memorial like they do every year. And they will take him as gifts. This year, however, will be special on his birthday. Because he'll receive the biggest gift of all. A gift from you. That a jury in Laredo, Texas is giving him and his mommy justice. Objection. Those arguments are He will now be able to smile, run, laugh, and rest peacefully. Dominic has left so many clues during this case. It's amazing. His precious blood at the crime scene, his Tweety Bird, his favorite train at grandma's house. All you have to do is look, listen, and learn. And even though he's not here with us physically, he speaks to you. He speaks to you. He speaks to you through me. This case is not about me. It's not about the state. It's not about politics. It's about truth. It's about justice. It's about doing the right thing. It's about giving the right punishment. It's about protecting society. It's about accountability. It's about closure for the family. And it's about deterrence. It's about deterrence. This is not about religion. This is not about revenge. It's about the law. It is about the law. You know, when Mr. Boggs was in his opening, he went over there and puts his hands on Mr. Burgos and says, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Burgos is a dead man. He is going to die. Death is certain for all of us. The only difference is that when Mr. Burgos planned and executed his own flesh and blood, an innocent baby, and the mother of that baby,
he scheduled his own death. On April the 9th of 2018, he scheduled his own death. Deserve has nothing to do with this. He earned the sentence. Each and every one of you, each and every single one of you, are the last link for law enforcement. In the criminal justice process, everything that we've done since we came together at TAMIU, almost close to 400 people, why? Why you? Like me, you took an oath to follow the law. Each and every one of you. We cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone. You can give Dominic and Griselda the justice that they deserve. You see the difference? What he earned is the death penalty. And what Dominic and Griselda deserve is justice. So that when you carefully Callously plan and calculate the murder of a child, an innocent child and their mother. And you use your special skills, and you use your knowledge, and you hide in plain sight. There's consequences. That's the message you're going to send with your verdict. Objection on sending messages with a verdict. Mr. Hugh will be given the court's charge and will be given the instruction with regard to what to do and, and those are the things that you need to answer the questions inside the charge based on the instructions that I give you. Remember that when you receive the charge. The evidence that we have brought you in the guilt and innocence phase proves beyond a reasonable doubt. It proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Burgos Aviles will probably commit future acts of violence in the society where he's going. You sat here. There are no circumstances, none, not one or a few or any evidence of mitigation where to justify a sentence of life without parole instead of death. You took an oath and if you apply the law, if you apply the evidence, and you apply the facts, then you will answer yes on special issue, question number one. And you will answer no on special issue, number two. Life is sacred. I agree when Mr. Boggs stood here on Monday and said, life is sacred. 
And what did he say? It's sacred to everyone in here. Well, we know who it's not sacred to. It's not sacred to this man. The story, after three weeks in trial, the story ends with you here today. Remember what I said in opening. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end to every story. Your story will end today. And again, you've, hired the, you've answered the highest call of duty And I'll tell you what, Mr. Boggs, this is still a big and important case. It sure is. To all of you, to the state, to the people of Texas, to the Hernandezes. And we thank you for your service. Remember the first day at Tamiyu, we put this up. A true verdict render according to the law and the evidence will help you, God. A true verdict render according to the law and the evidence. The law and the evidence. We have worked hard in bringing you the facts and bringing you the evidence. And it shows the truth. It shows the truth. We have guided you. And you got it right in finding Mr. Budgos guilty. Your job is not done. The roadmap. How do you get to the right punishment? Remember, and all of you lived through this, during the time that we brought you here, and you were selected for, for jury, to sit on this jury. What evidence do you consider today when you go deliberate in answering the special issue? Y'all remember this chart? We, we went over it and over it and over it. Y'all know how to work through this chart. You look at the evidence. Not the guilty verdict. That's already been done. But you get the evidence from the first phase that you can consider plus all of the evidence that we brought you in this phase that you can consider in answering special issue question number one. The state must prove, just like we did in the guilt and innocence phase, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, that there's a probability that Ronald Anthony Burgos Avidas would commit criminal acts of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society. A probability that he'll commit criminal acts of violence that constitute a continuing threat to society. So what do we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Not that he will. Not that he will. Listen to that. But that he probably will. That's our burden. That he probably will. There's that word. And how do you make that decision? How, do you de how, how can you say that somebody will probably continue to commit acts of violence in the society where he's going? And we talked about the society. Where's he going? He's going to prison. And we all know that late, there's, what, what, did, what did Mr. Fitzpatrick say? That prison is a society within what? A society. Society within society. 
where people go and work, where they keep Texans safe. It's not a perfect society. It's not a perfect system. We know that. But we will now, and I will explain to you all of the evidence, all of the truth, all of the facts that we brought you in order to answer that question. That we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he probably will. That he's dangerous? We know that. We already all know that. So what do you consider? And here they are. This is what you will consider. The circumstances, the calculated nature, his forethought and deliberateness that he, ex that he exhibited, the existence of any prior criminal record, his age, his personal circumstances at the time of the offense, was he acting under duress? Psychiatric evidence? We know, we, know, we know the answer to that one, and we know the answer to the duress. We know the answer to the circumstances, the calculated nature. You all saw when, when he started doing this, and his character evidence. Multiple attempts on Dominic's life. Think about how many times he wanted to end baby Dominic's life. Think about it. Think about it as I go through this argument and, and I'll give you my our version of how many times he tried to take his life. But think carefully how many times he did. 27 stab wounds to Griselda Hernandez. Two stab wounds to Dominic. Rapid but not instant death. Dom, little baby Dominic bled. He was alone when he, when he bled. He was looking up at the sky when he bled. His own biological son, the weapon of choice, well, we know what it was. We know what it is. We never found it. Because who controls the crime scene? Who decides what to do with the evidence? He decided what to do with the evidence. Remember an opening statement. I told you that the state was going to bring you evidence to look into his heart. And to judge a person, you can't look at, you can't look at their appearance. You have to look into their heart. I, sh I told you that we were going to bring you evidence of the text messages that he was sending before, during, and after the murders of two innocent people. What was he doing during that time? He was sexting. That is so disturbing. That is so upsetting. And he did it all while serving his country. There was never any provocation by Griselda. You have the evidence. Go through the text messages. She didn't want to cause him any trouble. But did you ever see any attempt in all those messages saying, Hey, how can I help? What do you need? Will $500 help out right now? Something. No, no. Instead, he went into a plan to end the threat of two truly innocent people.
And what did, he, what did he do? What did he do when he was hiding there in plain sight? How do you hide in plain sight? Think about that. How do you hide in plain, in plain sight? When everybody there is law enforcement and you're dressed as law enforcement, but yet you're the danger within the law enforcement. That's how he did it. Dominic's age, the gruesome murder scene, the painful deaths, imagine. Imagine. It wasn't, it wasn't swift. It wasn't swift. It wasn't pulling the trigger one time. This was up close. This was personal. 27. Seven times. And then once through the baby's chest. And then one through his neck. Unforgivable. You saw Dr. Fernandez's testimony. You have the autopsy reports. Study them. Study them. When you want to imagine the type of pain that this young mother sustained at his hands. Look at it. Look at what he did to her. Look at her defensive wounds. Look at the way he left her. He attacked her from behind. He ambushed her. She didn't know. She didn't know that that was the last day that she, that, that was the last day of her life. I mean, she was gonna go meet a law enforcement officer. She thought they were good. This is how he left her. Listen, the state of Texas did not create this situation. We didn't create the facts or the circumstances or the evidence. As hard as he tried to disturb, to stage, to alter the crime scene, we found it. Now we're handing you the baton. We brought it to you.
What did Dr. Fernandez say? The person who did this had knowledge. The person who did this had knowledge. This man had the knowledge. And what did I say in opening about clarity? After those 27 stab wounds and killing this innocent mother, he walks the 20 yards over to the stroller, gets in front of this little baby, And it's like he's looking in the mirror, Mr. Boggs. He's looking right at himself. And he opens that buckle, takes the little phone out of his hands, puts it down, picks him up, takes him over to the grass, lays him down. Picks up the shirt. He wanted to get it right. He picks up this. Dominic's, one of Dominic's favorite shirts. And he pierces, aiming for his heart. And he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. When little baby Dominic is still alive, he goes for the jugular. How long did it take baby Dominic to die? With every beat of his heart, he would lose blood. What was going through his mind? Where's mommy? Where's my mommy? This man was a stranger. The death was rapid, but not instant. He lost blood with every heartbeat. First, he would have gone into shock. 10 minutes to die and the person who did this had knowledge. The calculated nature. I would submit that when, when Griselda advised Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, remember she did that practice message in December? Say, hey, I'm sorry, nothing. I don't want to mess you up, but I really need help. This is, I'm going through hell. I can't pay for school, I need help for daycare. Then in, on February 1st, she fills out the application. But when he finds out that this is coming, the wheels start turning. You have a choice. Do I man up and do the right thing and accept responsibility for this little innocent baby that I fathered? No. Let me go this way. Let me end him. Because he doesn't matter. Every life matters. Every human life matters. His life matters. That he planned it. And then you start seeing it on March 25th at Winfield Park. He knows that there's an appointment for child support. He sets up the meeting on the twin on and, and then the Winfield Park incident. Remember April the 4th, what does he do? 
He goes to Snapchat. We talked about that in Guilt and Innocence. This, this is all going to calculation. This is all going to planning. You don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to go kill my son and his mother. It doesn't happen like that. It takes planning. It takes calculations. Selecting when, where, and how he was going to do it. He scouts behind the church on April 7th. Remember from FBI agent Master's report. He goes behind the church on, on Del Mar on April the 7th to look at where to get rid of evidence. Then he's trying to set up the meeting with Griselda. It's set up on for the on the 8th for the 9th. He's involved in the scheduling of the assignments for Border Patrol. What did Agent Dennison tell us? That there was Carrizo eradication going on, right? And that they had to take the cameras down. Who knew this? Who knew this? He knew it. The perfect location to stage the crime. What he didn't bank on was that DPS was going to have a camera on one of the trails. That camera that caught him in Kilo Unit. Remember? When he was leaving at 1010 in his Kilo Unit? And he murders him on the 9th. He used considerable amount of time to calculate and plan the murders. Forethought, deliberateness, it all started with the child support. He gets served with the petition, with the notice of to, to set up to, to, to set up in order to have those meetings, to start having those negotiation conferences. And you remember when she texts him, hey, you missed your meeting. He had other plans. The injection site. Where and how he killed them. The manner and means of the death and cutting their carotid and their jugulars. How he ambushed, how he lured them to that dirt trail. Using his position, infiltrating the investigation, utilize time to his advantage. He contaminates the crime scene, he destroys evidence. And you see the video. What does he do when he gets in the car? Starts to lick. If you need to look at it again, it's there. But when he's sitting in the car, which arm is he? Taking the right arm. The right arm. He's taking any anywhere that he thinks he has blood, he's wiping it. All of that evidence you will utilize to answer special issue question number one with a resounding yes. A unanimous yes. It's clear. It's clear. We've brought it to you. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Not that he will commit future acts of violence, that he probably he probably will. That's, that's what we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And we've given you a mountain of evidence that you could use to answer special issue number one. Then you move to special issue number two. The state, we don't have this burden. Taking into consideration all the circumstances of the, of the offense once again. We don't leave that. You consider the circumstances, his character, which we've shown you. And we're going to talk more about his character. 
But take that into consideration. His background, his moral culpability. That these circumstances or circumstances or circumstances warrant that a sentence of life imprisonment without parole rather than death be imposed. Everything that Mr. Boggs promised you in his opening, they failed. And we're going to talk more about that. Stay focused throughout this process. And just like you hold me and my team to our promises, hold him to his promises. Hold him and his team to their promises that they come up here and made. No mitigation in answering this question. Is there any mitigation? If you follow the law, if you follow the evidence, the answer is simple. No. There's none. your approach with that? I don't remember that specifically. Oh my word, okay, they're approaching. So what I'm really going to do is just switch to the local news coverage because their logo doesn't block some of the what they're showing there. So just give me a second. Okay, sure, this is very powerful. My word. Yeah, this Burgos. I mean, I feel terrible for Jaden. Um, some people in the chat are saying, who's Jaden? Um, Griselda's eldest son. He's 12 years old now. And he's there. So it is hectic for him to hear all of this, of course. Um, but man, District Attorney Isidro Alanis describing things the way that he is is so powerful for the jury I mean, even counting the 27 times that he stabbed Griselda that's a lot you could see it and feel it it was like oh my word when he was demonstrating this and twice for baby Dominic and then he showed the shirt oh my word <laughs> Marie says uh Gee, the DA sure is a grizzly. His presentation is just perfect, just the way you do them. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Masterclass 101. It's really, really good. So now the defense team has objected three times now during this closing. And this one is about, he said, uh, Box said, I think this is in violation of a pretrial motion, I think he said. I think that's what I heard. But let's see. He's talking about mitigating factors. Unusual, but allowed. Yes. Okay. So we submit. Here we go. That whatever evidence was brought for mitigation, that you can still answer no. Weigh it. Consider it. I'm not telling you not to. Analyze it. Analyze all the evidence. And make your decision. It's your individual decision. And then collectively, unan unanimously, put no. We, throughout this entire process, have brought you consistent, credible, and corroborated evidence. Consistent, credible, corroborated, one layer after another so that you can make the decision. Let's go over that. Timothy Fitzpatrick. Now, 
let's make it very clear. Where does the defense want you to send Mr. Burgos? Where do they want you to send him? Life without the possibility of parole. So he could think about what he'd done. So that he can get punished for what he did. Really? Really, Mr. Box? We brought you Mr. Fitzpatrick, okay? 19 years or 21 years with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice in the corrections to show you what life in prison without the possibility of parole is. And what is it? Really, what is it? Recreational sports, education services, contact visitation, put up to 10 people on there four hours per, per visit, blow out birthday candles, color your coloring books. You want a job, just apply, sign up. You get to move around un unescorted around campus. You're in general population. You need a counselor, go see a counselor. Cable TV. They want to joke about the price is right. This is no joking matter. It's not. And it doesn't end there. Tablets, emails, music, subscriptions religious services in a dorm of what did he say 45 or 46 people he'll be living there if he needs outside medical care we'll take him so he can get medical care oh and he gets you get the cafeteria access sounds like he's going to college that's what it sounds like that's who they want to send them is that punishment for killing an innocent baby his innocent mother in a vicious and a brutal murder? Really? No, no. Now, if he wants to look in the mirror, let him do it on death row. There's a mirror in that cell. He'll have time to think. That's where he belongs, in an eight by 10 cinder block cell, 23 hours locked down. That's where he'll get to think about what he did. It, again, Your Honor, objection or argument for specific punishment is supposed to focus on special issues. I don't think it's. Miss, continue, move forward, please. Angelica Hernandez, the, you, you saw the pain. Angelica, the rest of her family will never be the same. <coughs> They'll never be the same. She had the courage to come up here and tell you. And when I asked her, how old would your sister be today? She, she, she looked in, at you and she said, she's frozen at 27. She's frozen at 27. And Mary Hernandez, the mother, freezes her room from that day. And that they go in there to reflect. Their lives did matter. They continue to matter. And life without the possibility of parole does not address that. Joshua Nunez. I don't remember, 16, 19, 18 year officer. What did he tell you? He sees the crime every single day. He sees the crime. He had to go and identify the body of his cousin and had to go and tell the rest of the family about it. Traumatized. You saw him. 
a man who has worked crime scenes, you saw him, how much trauma. Jose Luis Macias. Mr. Macias has no dog in this fight, okay? When Mr. Boxing is opening through in the psychosis, what Burgos didn't know back then was what Macias came and told you. At this trial. And you have it. That on April the 10th, when he was taken to Webb County Jail, there was observed no delusions and no psychotic symptoms. Forget about the testosterone. Forget about the fentermine. There was no psychosis. He can come up here in a little while and say it a hundred times. He was normal. There was no psychotic behavior caused by those hormones. The classic blame game. You know what? It was the doctor's fault that he did this. No, oh, it wasn't. Was it the doctor's fault, Mr. Boggs? Was it? Accountability, a grown man. Oh, it's because his mother didn't want him at birth. She had postpartum depression. But, but what does Mr. Burgos come up here and say, well, she was insecure. She was this, she was that. He grew up in, in Florida, married his high school sweetheart. There's no, there was nothing there. The childhood doesn't come into play. The man who he is, that is who you're judging. He had no active psychosis, no hallucinations, no signs of mental decomposition. And what, what, what was he concerned with? He was, and what were the words out of his own mouth when he got in the patrol car? This is fucking embarrassing. You guys are embarrassing me. And when he's talking to Reyes and Elizondo, you guys are fucking embarrassing me. This is a big embarrassment. Everybody at the station is, is, is already gonna hear about it. He says it in the car. He says it at the station. When he gets to the jail, he tells Masia, this is embarrassing. And then when his dad comes up here, he says, this is all over the media, all over the world. This is embarrassing. Really? What about the two little, the, two, the little baby that was killed and his mother? Stop thinking about yourself. He was normal. We brought you Dr. Dagoberto Gonzalez, a decorated Air Force physician with experience of administering and prescribing testosterone fetterman since 2013. A Remedex as well. It does he refuted everything that Dr. Gupta came and said, okay? Who are you gonna trust, Dr. Gupta or what Dr. Gonzalez said? Because you decide if you believe some, none or all of the testimony of the experts that were brought. You could take Dr. Gonzalez's testimony to the bank. Testosterone does not cause psychosis. The combination of the three do not cause psychosis. The dosages were within normal ranges. The lab results were at the lower end of the range and the 11 physician screenings were all normal. 10 minutes on your first hour. There's industry safeguards. The fentramine extended use is normal. 
Remember the, the, the example he gave of using a Remedex, which was not prescribed for that, but that you could use, I, I forgot what he said, but you know, there's that off use, right? That the benefits in other ways. He used, I think, Ozempix as an example. No psychosis. He's prescribed this thousands of times. And I asked Dr. Gupta the same thing. In all your 25 years, 27 years that Dr. Gupta was licensed, have you ever seen psychosis in testosterone in your patients? No, I haven't, Mr. Alanis. What about amphetamine? No, I haven't. There was three cases world, worldwide that, that Dr. Gonzalez found. And under very, what he said, extreme situations, did the fentramine cause psychosis? Why? Because it's not there, folks. It's not, it's not there. I don't care how many concoctions Mr. Bog sits there and makes. It's not going to happen. Because the science doesn't lie. That it causes anger? That was the worst that, that came out. Dr. Wilson said, well, it can elevate your anger. You get emotional, anxious, all of those things. And of course, if fentramin does cause psychosis, it's at the onset, in combination with fenfen, or there's an overdosage where you're taking four to five times of the prescribed level. Those were the situations in which fentramin causes psychosis. Ladies and gentlemen, do not follow their rabbit trails. Do not go for their smoke screens. Objection to the denigration of defense counsel. It's argument, Your Honor. Stay focused. Stay focused. He was, and most importantly, he was absolutely not poisoned. Absolutely not poisoned. Now, they didn't like that response. You saw. They didn't like it. But it's the truth. And that's what we're here for, the truth. Remember this, we acknowledge the loss and grief. Everyone condemns and understands how lawful this crime is. He said in openings, all of us I believe in this room believe in the sanctity of life. There is no doubt about it. We know who doesn't believe in the sanctity of life. He's sitting right there. He also said he has committed no criminal acts of violence in the five years he's been incarcerated leading up to the trial. You will hear from jailers who will describe him, describe him as a communicative, easy, quiet, and inmate who gives them no problems. You know what? It's all by design. He knows. <laughs> this is classic. When they bring Elizondo up there, the retired jailer, and they ask her what books was he reading, what did she say? Harry Potter and psychology books. Psychology books is what he was reading. Oh, oh also the Bible. Uh, there, was a, there was some Bibles he was reading, religious stuff. He is on his best behavior because he knows what's at stake. Ronald has aspirations, remember that one? Ronald has aspirations and hopes to continue his career in his border patrol. When his dad drives around and sees the border patrol trucks, that's what he thinks about. Oh, what my son lost. Opportunities that my son mm -hmm. lost. What about Griselda's opportunities, her aspirations, her hopes? And what about Dominic's dreams? What about his opportunities? He'll never have them. He'll never have them. Gupta, we went over his testimony. He was found in violation by the medical board. 
but I was able to get some good information out of him. And it, 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 it ends up at the very same conclusion. And against what the defense promised you, that he was poisoned by his doctor. I asked Dr. Gupta that question. And he said, no, Mr. Alanis, that's not a fair statement. The records are there, folks. Look at them, OK? Dr. Howard Campbell, you remember him from University of Texas at El Paso? What was he? He was a drug trafficking expert. He had no business here, folks. I told him that his that that his 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 information was important. His studies were valuable, but not for this case. And what did he fall back on? Well, I talked to people at the supermarket. I talked to Mecarnasadas, the Border Patrol agents, and they're about machismo, steroids, barbecues, beer, side chicks. Well, do you have that data, doctor? No, well, I don't have it with me. Well, do you have those, do you do a questionnaire? No, no, I just ask. Really? Really? Is that what we're going with, folks? But he did make it a point to talk about chivalry. And chivalry, when I showed him the photos of what Ronald did, Ronald Anthony did to his son and to the mother of his son, and he said the right thing. That is not chivalry. So remember when he talked about we're going to bring you this culture and show you failed. Not true. Psychosis, not true. His childhood trauma, not true. Go back to the evidence. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Who does this apply to? Dr. Mark Cunningham, their expert. Where is Dr. Cunningham? 2,237 miles away in Seattle. That's how far it is to Huntsville. Sitting behind a computer screen, crunching his numbers, like if he knows what's best for Texas and for Texans. It's not that easy, folks. It's not that easy. We have people on the front lines in these prisons. Lives depend on it. And what did he say when, when asked? Well, I usually can tell with the first phone call if, some, if, if I'm gonna be able to determine serious violence. He said that, you heard him. Really? Just in one phone call? One of the things that jumps out about Cunningham's data is how old it is. Remember when he was pressed right off the bat how defensive he got about, hey, well, your book says, well, hey, hold on. My book's 10 years old. So don't, don't you know, 10 years old. You were bragging about your book to Mr. Box. Now when I ask you if I could read uh, page 112 of your book, you say, well, my book's 10 years old. Can you imagine going to college, first day of class, you sit down and they give you a book that tends, that's 10 years old? It's unreliable. It's unreliable. I saw a date on one of those slides that said 1975. Really? 2002, 1991. The most disturbing part about his studies is that Arizona, New Mexico, Oregon, Missouri, Georgia, federal law. They just forgot Alabama. They might as well throw that in there too. What do they have to do with Texas? Nothing. Nothing. How scripted was that testimony? How scripted was it? And the most important thing about his testimony was he, he's a psychologist, folks. 
And he didn't even bother to interview this man, Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, for his characteristics. Hey, don't you think it's important to sit down in front of the man that you're going to deter make such a strong opinion about and talk to him? That's not important. Well, it is important, folks. Maybe not to him. His, in his charts, and they're going to come here and they're going to just build up his, they're going to build up his testimony. But hold them accountable. How do you explain that if you use a gun, you get a, a minus one on his scoring system? And if you kill multiple victims, guess what? Zero. That doesn't affect your predictability. But if you use a knife or a sharp edge, it's not even considered. That doesn't, that doesn't factor in. Dude, he stabbed this poor lady 27 times. Don't you think that should be put into your formula somewhere? That he used a knife? He used a knife. That he cut his son's throat using a knife. Killing your own family member. Does that go into your formula? No, that's not a variable that goes into consideration. The severity was not uh, was not considered. When asked about the video interview to look at his behavior, you're a psychologist. Don't you think it's important to look at the behavior of the subject that you're going to opine on? Well, I fast forwarded that section. Come on, man. No, that's wrong. Just an objection. The state fast forwarded through their own video for this jury. Right. Never, never did, Your Honor. Never did. We brought you well, everything. You. Well, the, the jury is going to have all the evidence, half all the evidence that has already been submitted and been into the evidence. It will take that into account when deliberating under my instructions. Please remember that as best as you can. What did he say? I'm not testifying for the defense. I was called by the defense. He was argumentative about everything. 48 escapes. You know about that, Dr. Cunningham? Yes, but uh, that's that also that means like they walk off campus and that's an escape. Really? Minimizing. Minimizing. No statistics on prison escapes. We asked them, do you have any information on prison escapes since 1974 that you could share with the jury? No, I don't. Why? Why? You have a the privilege to ask why he doesn't have that information. And then he says on one of the questions, and he's not even here for that, he says, well, he was high on testosterone, high doses of testosterone and fetterment that contributed to his rage. Those around the interview questions? Really? You're not even here for that. He was backed up in a corner and he throws out Dr. Gupta's. Look for the signs, folks. He did agree that prisons are not 100% safe or secure. How? And like, I trust Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick told it like it is, right? Objection to the sustained. He did. He did. Fitzpatrick's testimony was credible. He brought you facts. He brought you information. Prisons are not 100% proof, right? Why? Because they're run by people. People are fallible. People are calculating. People are conniving. People plan. The escape came up with Dr. Cunningham but don't pay attention to that. That's an anomaly. That's an anomaly on that escape. No, it's not. That's reality. That's what it is. And five people died because of that. That came out from the witness stand. Objection talking about I never mentioned the name, Your Honor. I talked about an escape. Mr. Please wait till I give my ruling before you respond. Yes, sir. All right. 
Let's move on. His argument to move on is keep it within the confines of the. Of the uh, what did he say? Minimal evidence. He finally agreed after sh being shown his book that he agreed that direct evaluative contact with a capital defendant is considered the best practice and should be requested by the mental health professional in all cases. And he violated that number one rule from his own book. But they'll tell you, well, that's not what he was going to do. But it's in his book. Follow the book. On April the 9th, was Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles a low-risk person for committing serious acts of violence? Looking at all his characteristics on that day, was there any way of even imagining that this man would have done what he did? No, because statistics don't work. You're dealing with humans. The more states that he put into his pot, his melting pot, the higher the numbers go and the lower the percentage goes for risk. It's just this, moving around numbers. That's what they're doing. Commander Jose Hernandez, they brought him here to tell you what? That for five years, he's been a model inmate. Well, I'll tell you what, I did take from Dr. Cunningham. Remember that example he said, there's a difference when you're driving with your dad and when you're driving with your friends, that's all it is. That's all Mr. Burgos is doing right now at the jail. He's on his best behavior, right? Because the jail staff, Commander Hernandez, Lieutenant Elizondo, those are the people that, that are like his dad, right? So he's on his best. That's all he showed. Again, psychology books that Burgos is requesting. What did Mr. Ronald Anthony Burgos' father come and say? He was in denial, folks. He comes here and must say at least 10 times how proud he is of his son, that he will continue to be proud of his son, and that he loves his son. Then when I ask him, did you see the mountain of evidence that we brought you? Did you see it? What did he say? It was all circumstantial. There was no direct evidence. And my son is losing his opportunities. And what does he say? Sin originates from who? from Satan, he said. Sin originates from Satan. And when I asked him, is killing your own flesh and blood, your own baby, an evil act? He said yes. He said yes. Never visited Dominic's memorials, never visited Selda's memorial. I'm just so upset that this is being co covered all over the news. I'm just so upset that my son lost his opportunities. And I'll never believe he could do this to anybody. It's not reality, folks. You can answer no. Special issue. Number two, you can answer no. You don't want to be in a situation where you say, we should have, we could have. You don't. Down the road, you don't want to be in that position. We had the chance and we didn't. Stay focused. He's gonna come up here now, give their argument. 
use your common sense, hold them to the evidence, hold them to the facts, hold him accountable. To show that you deserve mercy, you must first give it to others. Listen to that. <clears throat> Listen to that. You must first give mercy to others. What mercy, what kindness did Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles give on April the 9th of 2018 when he stabbed Griselda 27 times? No clarity when he walked over to take his son out of the stroller, when he put him down. Both of their organs, remember, both of their organs were bleached. They bled out. Baby Dominic took more than 10 minutes to bleed out. What mercy, what mercy did he give to these people, to these innocent people? Stay focused. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, counsel, there are two things that I agree entirely with Mr. Allen Lee's about. The first is, that this was an unforgivable act, completely unforgivable. I don't want anyone here in that jury room or anyone here to think that in anything we are doing says that we are asking for forgiveness for Ronald. What we are asking is that he be punished for the rest of his life. That is what we are asking for. Now, the second thing that I'm in complete agreement with Mr. Alanese is that life is sacred. Now, and every life is sacred, which is what you heard Mr. Alanese follow up with, his life is sacred. Every life. Dominic's life was sacred. Griselle's, Griselda's life was sacred. But that means everyone's life is sacred. We're either all children of God or no one is a child of God, is what I would say to you. Now, I opened and started, and Mr. Alanis was correct, in that I believe I put my hands on the shoulders of Ronald and said, this man is going to die in prison no matter what decision you make. And that is true to this day. No matter what decision, he is never going to be free again. I have to look at my notes. I apologize. You have to, the question now that uh, I want to pose to you is whether we strap Mr. Burgos Aviles, that living, breathing human, to a gurney and inject him with sodium chloride, stopping his heartbeat, and kill him on Texas time, whether it's a politician like Ken Paxton, who decides when he dies, or is it on God's time, living out his natural life? Now, we've discussed the, the two phases of the trial. The first phase we call the guilt phase. And that was about objective facts, about what happened. And that's why your verdict had to be unanimous, one way or the other. Either something happened or something didn't happen. Now we're in the penalty phase. Now, I know Mr. Alanis would like very much for us to stay in that guilt phase because they had a very strong case. It was obvious that it had a very strong case. Matter of fact, almost everyone who came into Tammy Yu and then came and sat in that stand said over and over, yeah, everybody knows he's guilty. That's why Mr. Alanese would like to keep talking about that first phase, the guilt phase. But we are now in the penalty phase where each of you will make an individual decision based on your own beliefs, applying yes, as Mr. Alanese says, the facts and the law with your own individual approach. And that is why you've been chosen. It's simple. 
You get a choice, 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 you get a choice. This is the penalty phase. It's not the guilt phase where it must be unanimous. The only way that Mr. Burgos Aviles is executed on Texas time is if all of you, in your own individual choice, make that decision. You even heard Mr. Alan Nee say that during his first part of his closing. It's very simple. Every life is sacred. As Mr. Alan Nee said, every life matters. I'm asking you to condemn the sin, not the sinner. Now, this has been a, uh, this is a sad case. This is a terrible, terrible case. And uh, I've said this every time I've had the opportunity and I will continue to say it. I don't want anything for my advocacy and our advocacy for Ronald's life for someone to take away that somehow we don't believe that the lives of Dominic and Griselda are important or valuable. We grieve for their loss. We treasure those lives. We, it's indescribably sad. It's unbelievable what happened to them. Mr. Alanis um, very much wants to show you these horrible graphic photos that, of the crime. It's undescribable. It's unforgivable. No one is asking you to forgive Ronald Burgos Avilas. We're asking you to apply the facts and law and bring your own judgment to those things. Now, what I suggest to you is that the only way to get through the tragedy and the sadness is to, as these district attorneys told you to do during your voir dire, which is to set aside the emotions, to set aside your feelings, and apply the facts and the law. The difference is the question we have about what the facts and the law mean in this case. Now, I talked to you in my opening about our shared burden. I have carried a burden of asking for a life for some time. And uh, I feel that burden very deeply today. And if, in a little while, I'm gonna pass that burden off to you to make a decision about whether or not to take a life. I'm begging you, right? This is very emotional to use the law and evidence to ease the weight of that burden. Condemn the sin and not the man because we are all sinners and we all fail. I, I apologize, my throat is catching. Now, you heard the story that Ronald told Amy in their phone call. He said, I read this story and I was thinking about you and I was thinking about the kids. It's a story about a man who doesn't appreciate his wife, he doesn't appreciate his life, he parties too much, New Orleans, Mardi Gras, and he starts to drown at sea. And he's saved and he realizes what he's lost because God gives him a lifeline. And it's at that point that gives him faith. Now, Ronald's story, we suggest, is an apology to his wife and his children. He's telling her he didn't appreciate her and he didn't appreciate what he had. This is Ronald's repenting through God. You have to condemn the sin and not the man. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the special issues. But before I do, the reason we have this slide up is because we want to remind you about where the word penitentiary comes from. It comes from penitence. 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 Which means to repent or sorrow or regret for doing wrong. Ronald has a lot to repent for. Terrible, terrible sins. 
he's going to be sent to the penitentiary for the rest of his life for that repentance. In the opening, I talked about how much Dominic and uh, saw Mr. Alanese made reference to it in his closing. Send him to death row. They have mirrors on death row. I don't believe actually that's what Mr. Fitzpatrick said, but um, to me and the testimony that Fitzpatrick gave you is that the, the guys on death row, right, they got individual attention. They came to them individually, right? There was something special about it. My answer is, is that Ronald's going to be a face in the crowd. Right? A face in the crowd. Just another murderer, another terrible story. Every time he passes a window pane and he sees his own face, he's going to see Dominic. He's going to reflect on that. It's going to be his punishment for the rest of his life. Now, you also heard a few of the calls between Ronald and his wife. Right? Some of them were rude. But you also heard that beautiful call about reckless love and the story about Ronald's dream. That is Ronald. <coughs> this is an important day. And voice is giving out. <coughs> that is Ronald beginning his lifelong penitence. That beautiful dream of reckless love. Now, I know uh, Mr. Alanese in his remaining 15 minutes is going to remind you of the poor behavior of Ronald, of his messages to other women. He has a lot to repent, that's obvious. He's murdered two people. But I'm asking you to condemn the sin and not the man. I'd like to talk to you about family and faith. I'm gonna start with Ronald's wife, Amy. Poor Amy, everything that she's been through, right? She's, in addition to what she's been through with her childhood sweetheart, she's had to have her personal calls to her life love played throughout the world. Now, I want to remind everyone, it's easy to take a moment in a relationship out of context to make it look good or bad. All these relationships have struggles within them, moments that are difficult, but at the same time, there are moments of love and tenderness, and you heard that. Everyone is more complex than the single moment of the worst thing that is happening. You also saw a cruel video of Ronald with his child, but you also saw messages from Ronald to his children trying to still be a father from a jail cell in Laredo. It's just much more complicated than that. He's made a terrible, tragic, irreversible, and overwhelming mistake. The act is evil. You heard Mr. Uh, Alanese talk about Ronald's father, uh, Carlos, describe it as an evil act from Satan. We all say it's evil. It's obviously evil. It's a terrible act. But you also heard Carlos say, you condemn the sin and not the sinner. Now, I'd like to talk about special issue one. And I'm going to keep reminding everybody, right, before Ronald can be sentenced to death, you each have to make an individual decision whether there is a probability, not a possibility, of whether Ronald would commit criminal acts of violence in the future that would constitute a continuing threat to society. Now, and again, I remind you over and over, right, it's the state that bears this burden. So when Mr. Alanis says, well, you're not saying that he will do it, you're saying that there will, there's a probability he will do it, okay? Do you see how the playing with the words? Don't worry, you're not saying he's yeah, going to do it. I'm object to that. Saying that I'm playing with the words, I'm not playing with the words, you know. Overall, it's, 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 uh... Well, do you see the point of the words, the distinction that Mr. Alanis is trying to make, right? He's trying to relieve you of the burden of grading what the state has to present you. Because 
Now, later on, right, we're going to talk about Dunny, Dr. Cunningham a little in Dr. Cunningham's book, which says that an individualized assessment interview is the best way to do it. Now, why would the defense bring you that when they have the burden? They have the burden to show that that man is a continuing threat to society. So what I say to you is, is that when you make that decision, when you answer the question, right, you're not saying that there is no chance that Mr. Burgos Avilas is a continuing threat to society. What you are saying is the state hasn't proven their burden beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is the law. And that is the difference. Now, I want to talk about what underlies this, because that was a part of the testimony of Dr. Cunningham. The reason why you have to answer special issue one is because the law says that if someone is incapacitated, and what did Dr. Cunningham mean by that? If someone is no longer a threat to Texas, to society, then life in prison is enough. We only get to special issue two if they are a continuing threat to society. So as you think about answering this question and as you work through this special issue, you've got to know if Ronald is no longer a threat to society, then his punishment is life in prison. It's not the death penalty. And you'll also remember that during every one of your voir dires, every single one of these prosecutors told you that in special issue one, you can consider the facts and circumstances of the crime, but we're going to bring you something extra, something extra to meet our proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what did they bring you extra? They brought you Mr. Fitzpatrick. Now, Mr. Fitzpatrick is, you know, there's some ironies here. He's the head of classification. But it was a little odd, right? Because we had an official, a longtime official from the Texas Department of Corrections and Justice who basically came and said, we can't handle it. We can't handle this situation. Now, the facts and the actual data and the statistics suggested something different, which is what I asked Mr. Fitzpatrick about in cross-examination. How often are the escapes? How many prisoners are there? So that is less than 1%, less than a half a percent, a 0.1%. And those are the answers that you got from Mr. Fitzpatrick, that it, they are very good at their classification. They've been doing this for decades. I asked Mr. Fitzpatrick, did you create this classification system? And he said, no, it's been developed since way before I got there. It's over and over and over. So. I want you to sit as you evaluate this evidence from Mr. Fitzpatrick and think about the ironies, right? What you wouldn't expect from a Texas Department of Correction official telling you that they can't do their job when the numbers suggest something entirely different. Furthermore, what else did uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick tell you? He told you every individual is different. Now, when I asked explicitly, Mr. Fitzpatrick, you're not here to give an individual assessment of Ronald Burgos Avilas, are you? And he said, oh no, I have no, no knowledge, no opinion of it. Did you review his jail records even from Webb County? No, I haven't looked at his jail records from Webb County. So I ask you, when these people have the burden of proof to show that Mr. Burgos Avilas can't be incapacitated, how can they say they met their burden of proof when the only additional witness they brought told you, no, I'm not here to get an individual assessment. I haven't even looked at his jail records. Sit with that moment. So when Mr. Alanese says, oh, Dr. Cunningham said the best way to provide this information is to give an individual assessment, well, the only witness, and they have the burden of proof, the only witness they brought told you directly, I have nothing to say about this individual. I have something to say about other individuals who are unrelated, who might have caused problems in the past, and you guys should be scared. It has nothing to do with Ronald.
So what did Mr. Alaniz rely on today when he was talking to you? He went through his slides and said, this was a horrible crime. This was a terrible, terrible, awful crime. That's why you should fear Ronald Purvis of Elis, because this was an awful, awful crime. Well, we know it's an awful crime. We told you it was an awful crime in your voir dires when we said, how would you, you, know, how would you look at someone who killed a woman and killed a child under 10 years old? Mr. Pena, the first day we all met at Tammy U, told you this is a horrific, horrible crime that doesn't make any sense. What I'm telling you is, and what Dr. Cunningham also told you, who I'll get back to in just a moment, is that just because someone commits a horrible crime in the past doesn't actually mean anything in the context of how they'll be incarcerated. And you remember that chart that uh, Dr. Cunningham gave where he said crimes are a product of the context and the situation that they're in. I know that it's difficult to put together how someone who could do something as horrific as this crime is is in a continuing threat to society, but that is the data. That are the facts. Now, just now, you heard the district attorney talk about, uh, and this is how he started, this man scheduled his own death on April 9th. He's the one who scheduled his death. Now, what does that mean, right? That means that what they're saying is, is don't pay attention to these special issues. If you found him guilty, he scheduled his own death, then the death penalty is automatic when every single one of these prosecutors told you when you were picked at jurors, it's not automatic. It's not automatic, right? We have to bring you something more. We have to prove something to you. Now look, let's look at the evidence that you have to counter the circumstances of the crime. You have five years of data from the Webb County Sheriff's Office. Five years of data. Now, Mr. Alanese, during his closing argument, said, oh, this man is so clever. For five years, he's been faking it. He's faking it for five years. I want to remind you what we lived through these past five years, right? Because you remember Mr. Alan East started with, it's time, right? How long it's taken, now it's time, right? We've lived through a pandemic where the Webb County Jail was essentially shut down. What I suggest to you is nobody can take five years of respectable, quiet behavior. That's, that's, that's not, it doesn't make any sense. All right. Now, he also made a big deal of, and I'll, I'll talk about sweet, retired Lieutenant Elizondo in a moment. Oh, he's getting psychology books. So he's reading about psychology because he's a big criminal mastermind. Well, what I would suggest to you is, is you know what kind of books are self-help books? He didn't say psychology that. Books. So when you <laughs> want to try to improve yourself, when you want to try to be a better person, when you want to try to reflect on your sins, when you want to do penitence, you get psychology books so you can learn about yourself. That's what psychology books are about. So now, it's interesting too, right? Because they're relying on his planning and his destroying evidence at the scene as his criminal mastermind as to why you should believe he's a future, that he has a, a continuing act of, that he's a continuing threat to society. Well, let's talk about his mastermind at the scene, right? You heard all those officers say from the first trial that actually he wasn't very good, that he looked like he was about to get sick, right? So. He, he couldn't pull it off you, all right? That's the thing for you to remember. If someone back in that jury room says, oh, I believe, you know, he planned it, he tried to destroy the scene, you've got to say to them, he's no criminal mastermind. It's like a, it's like a child, and that's what I told you the first day we started. We know. Stage, which is Double digit IQ. It's like a child. Mm-hmm. Right? Who would think they could get away with this? A dumbass. A child. And uh, 
You know, you um, heard Mr. Alanese refer to the, the interrogation video. We were all here that day. It was maddening to watch. It was maddening for me to watch. Because why? Because it was like watching an adolescent child, like a bratty adolescent. He's no criminal mastermind. He's no continuing threat to society. He couldn't pull it off. Now, what else did we bring you, right? In addition to the fact that you know that he's been a, 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 an excellent prisoner for these five years through a pandemic, we brought you the commander of the Webb County Jail, right? Now, I suggest to you, and uh, I'm not allowed to bolster a witness, but in this case, I will, what I would suggest to you is that this is a straight shooter, okay? This guy, he's a career law enforcement officer. He's no friend of a convicted murderer. He has no bias here. He has nothing. He's not gonna do the convicted capital murderer any favors, right? He's not gonna come in and, and try to boost or get something over. And what did he tell you? That he knew of no incidents in which Ronald was disrespectful or violent with any staff member or other inmates. In addition, we brought you a lieutenant, retired sweet Lieutenant Elizondo, who the worst thing, who dealt with Ronald regularly because she dealt with the mail, and the worst thing she could say is that he complained sometimes because he wanted his books. So Ronald wanted his, his books about religion and he wanted his books about God. That was the worst thing. He was never disrespectful. He was never violent. He was never threatening for five years in the Webb County Jail. Now, Dr. Cunningham. You spent a long day with Dr. Cunningham. And uh, I understand why the district attorney's office has devoted so much time in their slides to Dr. Cunningham because He's very persuasive, right? You remember that um, the other thing that Timothy Fitzpatrick said to you was, no one has a crystal ball, right? The two things he said, every individual is different and no one has a crystal ball. And you remember Mr. Allen E saying, do you have a crystal ball up there? And Mr. Fitzpatrick saying, no, I don't have a crystal ball. And he's saying, do you see a crystal ball on my desk? No, I don't see one. Do you see one on Mr. Boggs' desk? Do you see a crystal ball? No, nobody has a crystal ball. That's right. So, and Dr. Cunningham went through that, right? Nobody has a crystal ball, and that's the distinction he made. So if no one has a crystal ball, and they have the burden to prove that that man is a continuing threat to society, how, how are we gonna do it? What is the best evidence to do that? if we can't predict the future, if we can't look into a crystal ball. It's the facts, it's the data, right? So you heard Mr. Alani say, oh, that was from other states. It was from all the other states except Alabama. You remember Dr. Cunningham saying, well, that data, first off, a lot of it is from Texas, and number two, there's no reason why jails are pretty much the same in other places, right? So what I would suggest to you is that they have the burden, they presented you no evidence, zero evidence, making any individualized assessment of Ronald Burgess Avilas. The only data, the only facts you have came from the defense, from Commander Hernandez, from Lieutenant Elizondo, and from a distinguished psychologist, board certified in both clinical psychology and forensic psychology, who's published numerous times and cited in United States Supreme Court cases, versus, well, I'm sorry, but nothing. Now, the other thing I would uh, say to you is, is you're allowed to consider everything that's in this courtroom as a part of your jury deliberations. Do you see all those uniformed deputies? All right, we've seen them all over throughout this trial. See those handsome, super well-dressed deputies that have been uh, with Mr. Burgos Avilas? Okay. You know this district attorney has subpoena power, right? 
and that he could get any one of those deputies to come in here and testify if Mr. Burgos Aviles was a threat or if he was violent or ever even disrespectful, right? Did you see any of these deputies? Did you see these handsome deputies back here who deal with them every day testify? You did not. Who has the burden of proof? The state has the burden of proof. Mr. Burgos Aviles is not a continuing threat to society. That should be obvious. Now I want to talk about special issue two. Now the truth is you shouldn't get to special issue two because the state has failed to meet their burden of proof on special issue one. You shouldn't even look at special issue number two. However, I am forced to talk about psychosis. Now, I understand why um, these prosecutors and Mr. Alanese want to focus on psychosis. I do not believe at, at any point I said Ronald was suffering from psychosis. At any point did I say that. If Ronald was suffering from psychosis, we wouldn't be here right now. He'd be not guilty by reason of insanity. It doesn't make any sense. To that statement that's a uh, mischaracterization of the law, Robert. That's, that's incorrect for him to inject that into the jury. Remember, jury, the, um, the court is going to give you and has given you what the, the law that is relevant to this case is going to be, and you should, you should receive all the law from uh, the court and from no one else. I also have the instructions in the, the court's charge with regard to um, what occurs when, in fact, uh, uh, something is given to you by the lawyer that is not, um, yeah, that it doesn't run similar or the same as, in fact, the court has already given you. So. Uh, please refer to that if you have any questions. Thank you. So I, I apologize. I don't mean any disrespect to these proceedings or to you, but um, you can hear my voice. And uh, I'm going to put a cough drop in. The point is this, is that if we'd said that Ronald was suffering from psychosis, you would have heard that from Mr. Pena at the beginning of the trial, is that he didn't know what he was doing. He was hearing voices. It would have been a defense to these acts. But that's not what we're saying. He wasn't suffering from psychosis. At no point did we say he was suffering from psychosis. What I said is that he was prescribed medication which can cause psychosis. Now, what do you know about those medications? Now, Mr. Alanese just told you, oh, you can forget about that. You can forget about that. All that, right? Now, um, Dr. Gonzalez. Now, he's a very uh, good OBGYN, clearly, right? Best of Laredo, many years over a long period of time, I have no doubt. Now, by his own testimony, you heard that he has a side business, which he calls a wellness clinic and spa, where he makes prescriptions for testosterone. And uh, may I suggest to you that the truth is, it seemed like he was a bit offended by Dr. Gupta, who said there are these clinics popping up all over the country that where you can go get testosterone and they'll freely prescribe it. And what I would suggest is that based on Dr. Gonzalez's testimony, that he was very clear. Like, it doesn't really matter what your levels are, that if you're feeling a little bad, yeah, testosterone can help. Now, when I asked uh, Dr. Gonzalez uh, these questions, right, so I'm talking about page 29 of the transcript, lines 13 through 16. So now you testified on direct examination that testosterone does have certain side effects. I believe you said hyper-emotional anger is that correct? Correct. So even if 
You don't believe anything else, all right? I'm telling you, right, the state's own witness, Dr. Gonzalez, said one of the side effects of testosterone was hyper-emotional anger. So when you look at those photos, right, and the, the video of uh, Rommel being rude to the police officers, and remember, he was always cooperative, he was never violent, but when he had a bad attitude, right, remember what drugs he was on. In addition, what else did Dr. Gonzalez uh, <coughs> say in his testimony that day? And I'm reading from the same page, lines 19 through 22. Okay, now, but hyper-emotional anger, that sounds like a mood-altering or a mind-altering. Would you agree with that? Answer, sure. So, here's what we know. He never said it was psychosis. It wasn't psychosis. If it was psychosis, we wouldn't be here today. We do know that it causes hyper-emotionality and anger and that it's mood-altering and mind-altering, which I believe was what I said in my opening argument, which is his mind wasn't right. He wasn't thinking right, okay? Now, at some point in uh, Mr. Alanese's closing argument, he was like, oh, the danger within, the hidden behind the bar, the badge. My question to you is, is you have a 28-year-old man okay, who has no prior criminal history, all right? Um, matter of fact, he's a naval veteran. He's a supervisor in the board, Border Patrol, which he achieved very quickly through hard work. But doesn't have any violence, suddenly goes out and commits a horrific, terrible crime, a disgusting, awful crime. Wouldn't you want to know what's going on in his mind, right? When you're weighing his moral blameworthiness, right? His moral culpability, wouldn't you want to know if there was something affecting him, if there was something going on? I'm going to object to this argument placing additional burdens on, on the state, Your Honor, that, uh, that we should be obligated to, to enter, uh, have them evaluate. This is argument of counsel and the jury, uh, both parties are allowed to give argument what they believe the uh, evidence has already shown and also to make reasonable inferences of their uh, Remember that any instruction that I've given you with regard to uh, that, um, that what counsel tells you, if it's not supported by the evidence or statements of law made by counsel, that if not in harmony with the laws stated by the court, that you should in fact follow what the court tells you. Thank you. So what I'm saying is, is wouldn't you want to know these things about what is going on in the person's mind? So nearly three decades of a, frankly, an accomplished life, right? He's progressing. He's immature. He cheats on his uh, wife, on his childhood sweetheart. But all of a sudden, out of that, he goes and commits these ghastly, disgusting crimes. Wouldn't as fact finders, as someone making individual moral choices, wouldn't you want to know if there was something in his head? Wouldn't that be relevant to you? Do you remember when the district attorney talked about Juan David Ortiz and he said, now isn't it true that Juan David Ortiz suffered from an IED and had a brain injury? Isn't that true? And that's why he received a life sentence even though he killed four people? Use that logic, right? Apply it to Ronald, right? The district attorney is telling you that Juan David Ortiz deserved a life sentence for killing four people because his mind wasn't right. His something was off in his head. The, uh, the testimony on the state was not seeking death on, on Juan David Ortiz. Which was their choice, right? And everyone knows that was their choice. They chose not to, and then when the witness was asked about it. He said, well, did you know that Juan David Ortiz had a brain injury and suffered from an IED in Iraq? It's the same logic. I beg of you to use it. Now, I don't want anyone to say that anything we've said excuses anything Ronald has said, all right? I'm in complete agreement with the district attorney. It is unforgivable. Right? 
No one is saying that, excuse it, but it is a window into his moral blameworthiness. And you remember during your voir dire, how these district attorneys all said, you're gonna answer a question about his moral blameworthiness, all right? Now, there's a difference between blame and moral blameworthiness, all right? He's blamed. You've convicted him, all right? He is blamed. There's no doubt about it. He's going to die in prison no matter what your individual choices are. He's blamed. And as you evaluate his moral blameworthiness, you have to think about what was going on in his head, just as what this district attorney did for Juan David Ortiz. It's the exact same logic. I'm asking you to use it. Now, you should also consider the district attorney's argument about the escapee that killed five people. And you remember, he literally just referred to it 45 minutes ago. Well, you know, it doesn't happen much, but it does happen, and they could get out, and they might kill a bunch of people, all right? Do you remember that escapee's record, Gonzalo Lopez? He had a decades-long history of criminal acts, right? That is nothing like Ronald Burgos Aviles. Nothing like Ronald Burgos Aviles. And again, I'm going to keep repeating it. I'm asking you to condemn the sin and not the man. Now, what do you know about this man? You know he's very flawed. He has a lot of flaws, right? He had affairs. He compulsively sought female attention. That was obvious. They made reference to it. Even on April 9th, right? Um, and the district attorney's office seems to be saying, forget about the special issues, all right? Forget about your oath. Forget about your duty. Look how gross this man is. He was sexting on the day that he killed someone, right? That's an emotional response. It is disgusting. That's awful. Sex seems probably disgusting on any day, but the point is he's flawed, all right? He spent his life striving, pursuing, and excelling despite all that, all right? Now, Mr. Alani said there is no mitigation evidence. Zero. No mitigation evidence. Well, what I would ask you to think about is the story that Carlos told you, all right, about Ronald as a little boy, right, who's desperate for his mother's attention, like every little boy. The bond between a, a, a mother and a son is a, is a holy one, is, is so important, all right? And uh, that little boy, right, didn't get the attention from his mom. You heard Carlos tell you he didn't understand it. He was so aghast, right, he was afraid to leave her alone with his children because he was afraid she would hurt them, right? And then once they got to be, after 13 years, he wasn't afraid anymore, and that's when he left. It's the day that he was no longer afraid. So at every time they show these immature, silly things, that ridiculous contacts with women, I want you to think about that little boy striving, desperate for his mother's attention. Desperate. The woman that, when she had a second son, she cherished him, giving him love, physical touch, taking care, all the things that she didn't give Ronald. So not only did he not get those things from his mother, but he had to grow up seeing his brother receiving all of those things. Now, uh, the district attorney played you uh, or showed you a, played you a phone call, it was in Spanish, and they provided you a translation of him being very rude to his mother. It was out of context, right? You learned later from Carlos that his mother shows up at a trial, his capital murder trial, where this state is seeking to execute him without any notice, right? Like it was a birthday party. Like, I'm gonna surprise everyone. I'm just gonna show up, right? I hadn't heard from her in forever. And yeah, he expressed frustration. Why would you show up? Why would you surprise me? Don't you know everyone's looking at me? Don't you know every moment I'm being scrutinized? 
But what they didn't show you, and what we showed you, is that the very next day, he wrote his mother a letter of apology. So the same mother who didn't hold him as a baby, and that time that we know is so vital for bonding, those first thousand days, right, who wouldn't touch him, who he wanted to be held, wouldn't, and then when she had a second child, preferred the second child, that same mother, who then has a birthday, acts like it's a birthday surprise for his capital murder trial, he's still trying to please her. He's still trying to make connections with her. He still loves her and writes her a letter of apology because he was rude to her the day before. So, all these relationships, right, they're more complicated. They're multidimensional, right? There's more to them. You can take a moment with Amy, right, and, and make it look like it's dirty, it's wrong, right? But then you take another moment and it's deep and it's meaningful. All these things deserve a context as you answer these questions. Now, Ronald's life. You heard from Carlos that when he was young, he left Puerto Rico and he moved to Florida. And uh, he worked hard in Florida, right? He graduated early from high school. He got his high school sweetheart pregnant. They were so young that they both lived with their own parents. That's how young they were. But because he wanted to provide he joined the Navy. He got a job, right? And he did well in the Navy. And then after he left the Navy, his grandmother and his father said, oh, you should go into the Border Patrol. And he'd always wanted to be a police officer. He'd always had a lifelong fascination with law enforcement. And you'll remember I told you that the truth is this <coughs> man, right, he identifies more with these officers in uniform here than he does with his defense counsel, which, in all truth, you might have seen in his uh, messages about his defense counsel. But that is who he is, right? He believes in following the rules, right? I know it's, it's so difficult to wrap our heads around that someone who could commit such ghastly acts believes in following the rules and wants to be respectful for, to officers, but that is who he is at his base. And you can consider his good behavior in jail, right, his respectful, quiet attitude in jail over these years as mitigating evidence. You can consider his prior military service as mitigating evidence. You can consider his service in the Border Patrol, even though, obviously, the way it ended. But you can consider all those things as mitigating evidence. Now, something else I want to talk about. Ronald is also a father. And uh, saying that, in this case, is complicated. It's messy. Ronald had three children. Two of them are still with us. He tries, he wants, even though he's in jail, to stay connected to them. You saw messages to them, writing to them, wishing them happy birthday. Okay. One of those children is, no, is not with us, is dead, grisly murdered by Ronald's own hand. Now, we condemn that, right? we don't forgive it, it is unforgivable, but we condemn the sin and not the man. And I'm asking you to let Ronald try, as you've seen him try in these past years, be a father as much as he can be to those two living sons. Now, a lot of 
the, when we talked to those 400 jurors that Mr. Alanese talked about, a lot of the comments were, remember the survey questionnaire, 29 pages? Um, I'm really curious, what was he thinking, right? What was he thinking? What was going on in his head? And that's something I want you all to take away as well, right? Because it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense that someone in nearly three decades of totally mundane, right, behavior, not exceptional, not violent, not criminal, right, no decades long history, right, suddenly goes and commits horrible acts like this. It doesn't make sense. What was he thinking? So you shouldn't get to special issue two, right? It shouldn't be a consideration. But as you think about it, I want you to think about, right, and it's true, the drugs that he was on, the fentermine, right? And you'll remember I asked Dr. Gonzalez, well, psychosis goes in stages, right? And uh, he said, yes. If you want, I can reread that testimony. And it's uh, same page, 29, lines 23 through 25. Okay, now there are phases of psychosis. Isn't that true? Answer, sure, right? So uh, I regret backing up a little bit and talking about psychosis because it's not a true issue in this case. We never said it was a true issue. We said it's mind altering, right? We said it affects the way you think. But even if someone back in that jury room says, oh, that's a, you know, a lawyer trick. They're trying to say he was under psychosis. You've got to say to them, I didn't say that, OK? And it doesn't turn on like a switch, like Mr. Alanese is telling you. There are phases to it, right? Your brain is affected. So, as you think about his moral culpability, right, and you make this individual decision, you've got to consider it, okay? What was he thinking? Something was going on in his head. Because nearly three decades of law-abiding, nonviolent behavior this crime, he's going to be labeled. He's going to be labeled a child killer. He's going to be labeled for the rest of his life as a capital murderer. But what was he thinking? It's not who he is. He, there's more to him than that. Now, soon you're going to sit down and have. And I talked about this in my opening. Soon you're going to sit down and you're going to have a civilized conversation with your other jurors about whether or not a living, breathing human in this room should be executed. It's kind of an incredible thought, right? You're, you're just going to talk about whether or not someone who's been with us all this time is going to be strapped down to a gurney and then executed. That's an awesome responsibility. Um, and there are things, you know, and, and we keep harping on these, that I want everyone to remember as you engage in this conversation, right? Is that nobody should be forced, yeah, no one should be forced to impose the death penalty on another person if they do not agree that it is the appropriate punishment, right? So what does that mean? It means that your other jurors, you should not bully other jurors, and you should not be bullied, right? If you see someone being bullied, um, you need to stand up and say, that's not appropriate, right? That isn't right. That isn't the way we conduct these uh, deliberations, right? It is your responsibility to make individual moral decisions about the special issues that determine the, the, the ultimate punishment, right? Your individual decisions, right? What you bring to it, okay? Now, we all agree we want you to apply the facts and the evidence, but you're going to still bring your own individual analysis to that. That is your job and responsibility as jurors. Now, um, 
The last one on this slide is under Texas law, the sentence of life without parole is respected as a final punishment for capital murder. I feel like I've talked a lot about this, right? The death penalty is not automatic. Everyone has said that, right? In fact, what you can infer from special issue one is that the only people who are eligible to be executed in Texas are those that pose a continuing threat to society. If they can be incapacitated, then life without parole is the appropriate punishment. It's enough. Frankly, some of these are a little repetitive. But so each juror must make their own individual moral judgment as the appropriate sentence, life in prison without parole or the death penalty. I feel like I've discussed this. Now, you all have a duty to deliberate, all right? Um, what does deliberation mean? It means that you consider uh, the other person's opinion. Now, after you deliberate and consider the other person's opinion, right, you, mu you might, you must, or you should agree to disagree if you two cannot meet. Why is that? Because this is an individual moral choice that you're making. This is the second phase. This is not the first phase, right? You're not determining what happened, like what facts occurred, either it did or it didn't. You're making individual choices. And once you've made your individual choice, you must vote in accordance with your own findings and conscience and never to vote in support of a verdict that you do not feel is correct. Okay, so, and uh, that goes both ways. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't go both ways. It goes both ways, all right? If you came here to give someone a death sentence, I probably already lost you, all right? And I'd suggest it's not accurate because the state hasn't met their burden on special issue one, but if you've deliberated and considered and you still you came here to give a death sentence and that is where you are, then you should vote according to that. And again, this is a little repetitive, I've said it. No juror should ever pressure another juror or feel pressured themselves to vote in violation of their conscience or their oath to make their own final decision on a verdict. Now, my theme is obviously condemn the sin, not the man. burden of speaking for life. And uh, I, I, I apologize. I don't want Mr. Alanese to say, oh, Carlos, he was just worried about himself. Oh, Mr. Boggs is talking about his own burden. I understand. This is a terrible crime, right? The Hernandez family, Angelica, Mary, her poor father. I talked about in my opening that 4th of July weekend, right, where we had several days off, and that the day before that weekend, we saw the crime scene photos, and I saw several of you crying, right? It was all I could do to stop myself from crying, and the joy and wonder of holding a child in your hands, which I hope you all have experienced or will experience. I know those things. But what I'd say to you is that I hope I've done justice to carrying this burden of um, speaking for a life and asking you to condemn the sin and not the sinner. This case has probably changed all of us. Right? We will never forget the things that we saw and heard here. Right? Just this morning, right, as I was getting dressed, and like I said, I wanted to do justice for speaking to a life. As I was getting dressed, I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, 
How do I love? How do I love? How do I love? And then what did I think? I thought about Griselda. Okay. And uh, or asking Adriana, how do I love? And the sadness that that means. And I'll be honest, many members of my team, right, and other lawyers have said, why do you keep talking about how sad it is? Can't you see that that's bad for Ronald? Can't you see we need not to talk about the sadness? The sadness is undeniable. Okay? The sadness is undeniable. There's no way around the sadness, right? It's a cloud, right? The only way this burden for me and which I'm going to give to you in a moment, right, to get through that sadness is to focus on the law and the evidence. That is the only way through this sadness. Ronald's going to die in prison no matter what your individual choices are. I'm asking you to do the courageous thing. Condemn the sin and not the man. I understand this district attorney's office wants you to vote for execution, right? I understand all these cameras in here, all this media. I understand what all that means as well. This is a big and important case. If it bleeds, it leads, right? That's what the media says. That's why they're here, all right? to vote with your oath, with your individual conscience. It's a courageous act. It's an important act. Ronald is guilty, all right? It breaks my heart, all right? It breaks my heart to think that the man that I've been working with, that I've sat next to, that I know is guilty, it literally breaks my heart, but I'm going to say to you what we all wish that we could have said to Ronald on April 9th of that year, which is this. You don't have to do it. Okay? You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. Ronald. Please condemn the sin and not the sinner. Vote with your conscience and follow your oath. We are all God's children or none of us are God's children. Life is sacred. Thank you, Mr. Bog. Mr. Alanich, you have the remaining time. there and see what sticks a play on words he finishes by saying vote your conscience the instructions say look at the facts look at the evidence you can't have it both ways Mr. Box you can't You are not here sentencing a child. Oh, he's a child. He was acting like a child. He was acting immature. He's not a child. (coughs) 
Use Juan David Ortiz. The state did not seek death on Juan David Ortiz. Mr. Ortiz did not kill his son. And in Ortiz's case, the defense brought mitigation. Accountability. This case is about accountability. We have given you all the evidence so that you can vote in good conscience to answer question one. Yes. And to answer question two, no. It's interesting to sit there and listen to the arguments by, by Mr. Boggs. He makes a big point about the mother. One of the other themes is the scripts. The scripts throughout this trial, right? The mother loves Ronald. I submit she came here to court to show her support for Ronald. But what happens when he sees her? What are you doing here? It's not part of the script. The one that's in court is me, not you. You heard the phone call. He ran her off. It didn't go. In deliberating on special issue number two, you shall consider all the evidence presented at guilt and innocence stage of trial and the punishment stage of trial, including but not limited to evidence of the defendant's character. You can consider the defendant's character, his background, and the personal moral culpability of the defendant. It's not the fact that he was texting that was disturbing. It was showing the depraved heart that he had, the callousness that he had in doing it before and after he just killed his son when he still had the blood on his hands while he waited here taking crotch picks waiting them to, for them to walk into their trap. Ladies and gentlemen, this didn't happen in a bubble. He uses the word suddenly. This suddenly happened. No, it didn't. They need a reality check. I submit that it started, this planning to kill baby Dominic started when he found out that she wanted child support. That went almost two months that this plan was in play. Well, it was a testosterone, okay? He's been in Webb County jail for almost five years. There's no testosterone there that that we know of. There's no Fetterman being injected, but yet he still has the anger issues. Okay? It's hard to get in the mind of a killer, but it's not hard to identify evil. It's not hard to identify evil. The acts committed by that man who's sitting there were evil. And what are the characteristics?
characteristics that you can consider. Road. He wants to define penitentiary. Let me define road. A dishonest or unprincipled person. An elephant or large, other large, wild animal driven away, living apart from the herd and having savage or destructive tendencies. Rogue. It's fitting that the defense puts that picture in their opening statements. He was a rogue officer. And he doesn't define who the Border Patrol are. He's not a Border Patrol agent today. He's a danger within the family, within law enforcement, and within the society that he's going to. Because if you're a threat and you get in his way, You know what his character says that he can do. If he can do it to an innocent baby, imagine a stranger. Actions speak louder than words. That's how you can tell his predictability. Initiating at 8.25 in the morning, before he's committing the murder, contact with Z. Begins sexting with Z at 8.40. Sending this picture barely an hour before the murders. His character. I won't even repeat what he says. But you can read it right there at 9.08 a.m. Less than 45 minutes before his baby and the young mother walk in to his trap. Mr. Block says that he's burdened, that he's going to pass this burden on to you. He's not passing a burden on to you. You're doing your job. What about the burden that the Hernandezes carry every single day? And the burden that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. What about their burden? They didn't deserve to be butchered the way they were. And if he could have gotten away with it, he would have. And he almost did. And thank God for her sister's protection and her friend that they were able to find him. Otherwise, he would have gotten away with it. Make no mistake. That man, after the murder, that's what he says, 19 minutes before he's detained. His character, you could consider that. The sinner and the sin. You can't have it both ways. We've always relied on the facts. We've always relied Ten on minutes. the evidence. What was that, Your Honor? Ten minutes. Thank you. Now I feel like it's a man who I find everything in the video. That's what I feel like. Yeah, like always. And I also saw that you probably put everything you're here. Just like everybody else. Everybody else. Me because when I was in, in, the, in the room and they were doing the questioning, I could hear them reading out messages of eggplant emojis that you were saying in the March of 2018. Like you just made me so mad at me. You betrayed me. You betrayed me. Oh, 
Well, maybe you should pray about that, I don't know. Maybe you should pray and, and ask for that answer. I'm going to ask your problem. Thank you. That's so very sweet of you, just like always. Oh, yeah, you know what? I'm over here and I don't know what the fuck it is. Did I get to you or what? But I just asked you, I don't want to fuck the game when you come out with your fucking answer, you know? I'm really fucked up. The blame game. That's what he's about. You want to know character? Listen to his phone calls. Aberrant behavior. No, ladies and gentlemen. It's in his heart. It's who he is. You want to judge somebody? Look into their heart. Don't look at their face. Look at what's in evidence. States Exhibit 584. I'll read it to you. They told me no, I'm staying in Laredo for trial since the judge thinks in, compar in comparison with the other one, Ortiz, he puts, mine is not as bad. He also said that the pretrial publicity is not as bad. The judge that saw my bond hearing two weeks after I got arrested, he denied my bail, but he gave Ortiz bail, even though he confessed to killing four people and ran away from the cops. I didn't confess because I didn't do shit and I didn't run. That's who you have there. That's in evidence. Hold on. Ah, it's Nay. She said she's going to talk to you in the AM and then come here in the afternoon. That other girl messaged me that she's going to go visit you tomorrow early, then come here in the afternoon. Take advantage if there's anything you want to tell me that you can't through here. Manipulating. Using his resources to break the rules. Remember this letter? They're going to fall from the sky into the ocean, and when they are there, they're going to sink into the deep Pacific Ocean. Let's give you a little glimpse into the way he thinks of people that are threats, of putting them in a box, and dropping them to the deep blue sea. These are the things that go in in somebody's evil mind. <coughs> Three times. Wanted Griselda to get an abortion. He wanted Dominic dead then. On March 25th, injecting him. He wanted him dead on that day. And finally successful on April the 9th of 2018. The lies on and on and on. Remember, all of that evidence, you can consider it in answering special issue questions number one and number two. I don't know whose car it is. Oh, it rings a bell. It's hard to explain the situation for the fucking jury, he says. It looks like she took a beating last night or whatever. It's a fucking major coincidence, he says. Hey, well, you know what? Give us your phone. I'm not giving you fucking shit. That's what he said. And you're going to apologize to me for accusing me of this. Remember he tells Reyes and he's on the, you guys are going to owe me an apology when all this is over. 
calculating, manipulative, deceptive. And they want you to send him to be a G3 inmate with all the rights, privileges, accommodations that they have. <coughs> we don't need more than the crime. The crime itself and its characteristics, the evidence, the facts, is all you need to answer question one with a yes and question two with a no. to his heart you know the answer wrap it up yes sir <laughs> after the meeting at the park I got three more slides your honor said evil is powerless if the good are unafraid evil is powerless if the good are unafraid and yes that takes courage and when you get in there I'll ask you on special issue number one where the probability that Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles would commit criminal acts of violence and constitute a continuing threat to society, answer yes and sign it. And on special issue number two, whether taking into consideration all the evidence and circumstances, his character, background, the personal moral culpability of the defendant, there is sufficient mitigating circumstances or circumstances to warrant a sentence of life in prison without parole, rather than death, sentence be imposed. Write in, no, and sign it. On both counts, yes to special issue number one, and no to special issue number two. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Members of the jury, I'll give you time to get back to your table if you'd like, sir. Thank you. 
I'm about to send you into the uh, jury room now to become again a jury deliberation room. Uh, I want you to start deliberating according to my instructions. I understand that the, also what you all ordered earlier is already just got there a couple of minutes ago. Uh, the ones who will stay in the jury deliberation room uh, will be the 12 jurors, which of course was now includes our new 12 jurors, and the alternates uh, will stay in the alternative room, which we have for you as well. Where should we go? Can you join us for the jury? In cause number 2018 CRA 852D1, in the case of the state of Texas versus Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, the jury has returned a unanimous verdict. I'm about to read the verdict of this jury on punishment as to count number one. Special issue number one on count one whether there is a probability that the defendant, Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, would commit criminal act of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society? Answer, yes. Signed by the foreperson. Answers to special issue number two. Whether taking into consideration all the evidence, including the circumstances of the offense, the defendant's character and background, and the personal moral culpability of the defendant, there is a sufficient mitigating circumstance or circumstances to warrant that a sentence of life imprisonment without parole rather than a death sentence be imposed. Answer, yes. Signed by the four persons of the jury. Verdict on punishment as to count number two, special issue number one. Whether there is a probability that the defendant, Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, would commit criminal acts of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society, answer yes, signed by the four person of the jury. As to special issue number two, whether taking into consideration all the evidence including the circumstances of the offense, the defendant's character and background, and the personal moral culpability of the defendant, there is a sufficient mitigating circumstance or circumstances to warrant that a sentence of life imprisonment without parole rather than a death sentence be imposed. Answer, yes, as to, signed by the fourth person of this jury. Thank you. Ma'am, you may be seated. Members of the jury, you heard me uh, read your verdict. It is a unanimous verdict. I'd like for you all to raise your right hand, the members of the jury, not the alternates, who in fact uh, will indicate to me that this is your individual verdict. Please raise your right hand now. Thank you. The record reflects that all 12 members of the jury have raised their right hand. Members of the jury, thank you uh, very much for your service. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask Mr. Rubio to send you back into the jury room for some final words and some documents that we need to also give you. I, uh, while you do that, I am going to, in fact, do the sentencing uh, as a result of your verdict, I now need to sentence the defendant. Uh, he, so you don't have to be here uh, when that occurs. You can start heading back into the deliberation room and wait for me there while I do that, or you may choose to remain, however you'd like. You'd like to go back or stay? Thank you. Will you bring the defendant forward, please?
Okay, so life without parole, if you guys missed that. Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles, you heard me announce the verdict of the jury with regard to both counts of this indictment. It is now my job to sentence you in accordance with that indictment, with that verdict. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. The jury answered both counts uh, one and two with regard to question number one, yes. The jury also answered uh, as to both counts one and two uh, on question, on special issue uh, number two, yes. As a result of that, After being found guilty by this jury of two counts of capital murder, and after giving us the verdict that they have just announced, it is my job now to pronounce sentence. As to count one of capital murder, and as a result of the sentence of the verdict of the jury, you will be sentenced on count one as to capital murder to a term of life without the possibility of parole. As to count two, after being found guilty of capital murder and after hearing the verdict from the jury on the phase two of this, of this trial, it, you will also serve a term of life without the possibility of parole. Your sentence will start immediately and I'll ask the sheriff's office to take you to back to the Webb County Jail to be processed in accordance with our procedures and transported to the facility as soon as possible. Court cost? $945. Thank you. Please have a seat. Right away. Your victim impact. We have uh, some members of the family on the victim impact statements. I have two. Is anyone else going to come up? I'll I'll start off by reading the first impact statement. Let me uh, with, uh, let me say this on the victim's impact statement. You may you may come forward. Uh, these are going to be uh, outside of, they're off the record, they're not on the record, they are supposed to be done after a sentence has been imposed so that no one's been influenced by the victim's impact statement. So uh, they are also, it's really important that we stay within the confines of the victim impact statement. I, I, I don't want to have to stop anybody from giving us their thoughts. Um, so please stay within the confines. I'm sure the district attorney's office have already advised you all what those confines are. So please come forward. You can stand here next to Mr. Alanis on this side. Thank you. I will. We are now off the record. Okay. Thank you. So I will first read the statement by the father. Ramiro Hernandez, he's asked me to read this. I, Ramiro Hernandez, father of Griselda Hernandez and grandfather of Dominic, will tell you that my life has changed forever. Nothing will ever be the same. Our clock stopped. It's very sad. Our family have a constant reminder of how life was before this nightmare when we lost Gray and Dominic. We also lost a piece of our hearts. Our Christmas, birthdays, and get-togethers are not like they used to be. Unless you have been through what we are going through, you will never know how we feel. Ramiro Jr. has asked me to read this to Mr. Burgos. 
What made you take my sister's and nephew's life? What's the worst that could have happened? Pay child support? Your wife forgave you. Like all the other girls you've been with or leave, you then start a new life. The way you took Grand Dominic out of this world, not even an animal would have done this to his own family. You did not only destroy our family, but you destroyed your family also. The only advantage you have is you can see your family over a screen. When will I get to see Gray and Dominic? When can Dre Gray and Dominic visit us? The way you talk to your mother and your wife tells me you ain't shit and never will be. Your dad said Satan did it, not you. Well, I believe your dad is a coward. Looking at it that way by not teaching you how to man up to your own actions. A father very well knows what their children are capable of. When you speak to your dad, tell him I'd gladly take him to the site where his grandson's last moments were. Daddy wasn't there. Family's gonna talk. My life, my world has become one filled with pain and sorrow and grief. If you want, if you can stand right behind that mic right there. Right there. This one over this I'll hold it. This one on this hand. I await justice for the barbaric horrific acts of violence that you executed and ended with Gray and Dominic's life. Until this judicial process is complete, it continues to be an ongoing detrimental journey for me. I continue to mourn and grieve. Every holiday, every family gathering, their chairs remain empty as my heart. This void, this emptiness, is filled with rage and fury. Not having my sister in this world has been the most difficult pain I've ever had to live with. The loss of our little angel Dominic has been of intense magnitude without comparison. A loss of this immensity changes one's course beliefs and questions my faith, to say the least. I will always celebrate Grace's life with us as she was always, will be remembered with her joy and laughter as she truly was. We are resilient. This is and will not be the end of me. My sister put up a hell of a fight. She set the bar pretty high. And I will not give up. I will not surrender. She is and was a warrior, a free-spirited, warm-hearted, and selfless soul. So much so that you, being a disgrace of human being as you are, had to drag her to where you ambushed her and cowardly rid of her and your son, a spineless, cowardly move. Yet, she stood before you, and as the warrior she is and was, she challenged you to your ambush, the ambush you set up, the ambush you planned out, the ambush you executed. You bullshit about God now, preaching the word in vain. There is not enough blood or flesh in your body to ever give justice to Gray and Dominic. I am cognizant of where you're going. I know where you are headed. And I damn you, I condemn you, not the sin, you with every fiber in my body, every emotion in my soul. 
the worst of most violent, sinister stays. I pray to all entities that you relieve the pain that you cause to my blood every minute, every day, until you are delivered to your maker and then you get to relive it in hell for all eternity. This is on behalf of Jaden, Grace, Griselda's son, and Dominic's brother. April 9, 2018 is the day my life wouldn't be the same anymore. In the blink of an eye, my mother and brother were taken away from me. Never will I see them again in my life. If only I could turn back time to stop this tragedy that happened to my mother and my baby brother. I'll never see Dominic grow. I will never see my mom become a nurse. My mother and brother will never see me grow. I become older through the years. My mother and brother won't be there. I really miss my little brother. I miss my mom but they will always have a place in my heart. My heart might feel lonely sometimes, but I will always know there's, there's still two in front of me. Dominic and my mother, Gray. I miss my mother. I miss my mother's laugh. My family would tell her when she laughed they would tell her to shut up, Gray. My mother would bring the joy of my family. Now it's not the same. No one to laugh incredibly. No one to make fun of each other. My mother would sacrifice anything for me and Dominic just for fun. I remember my mom would talk to us would take us to Imaginarium at Mall del Norte. My favorite things to do was play in the area where there was a pile of foam blocks. That was my favorite. I'm not sure about Dominic, though he would just wonder of curiosity as a one-year-old. It might be a small place, but it meant the world to me. My mother was the best mom I could ever ask for. She was a hard worker. She was a great cook and the best mother. And for Dominic, he was my best brother, my only brother, the brother that I wished for. Now I don't have nobody. Derek Dominic was my brother that I would call the boss baby. As in ways he wanted something in his way, he would get it. Simply just being a boss baby. Now I just don't get to see them. And I wish I could, but I can't because this is reality. And you can't change this reality. I wish this was a, a dream, but no, they're gone and not coming back. So for me, I don't have a mother or a brother, only memories. As I stand here in front of you with my broken heart, and tears in my eyes. But I need for you to hear every single word that I have to say to you. 
Anthony, because that's the name we know you from, Griselda. You killed my daughter and my grandson, Dominic. You ambushed them. You were a border patrol. You were there to protect them. But what did you do? Only God can forgive you. What a coward of you to have ambushed the mother, Griselda, and your own son, Dominic. I can imagine my grandson Dominic's face, his cries, when he saw his mom being ambushed. And then you reached out to him to get him out of that stroller, <laughs> thinking at that moment that he was going to be saved by his father. And what did you do? You just killed him. He was running into the arms of the murderer. <laughs> what an animal you are. 20 month old baby. Baby Dominic did not deserve this. Why? He was just a baby. He was my grandson. <laughs> I will not see Griselda or Dominic ever again. Jadis was Griselda's first son. He was six at that time. He's 12 now. Jaden had lost his mom and his brother forever. He cries for his mom. And Dominic, you have healed, you have killed two precious lives, my daughter and my grandson. And all because of what? Not being manned up. Is this what they deserved? Well, Jaden will no longer have his mom. The same way you held Dominic to take away his life, that's the same way. I thought your life would be taken away too, strapped like you did to me, to my Dominic. And now you want to know about prisons, high risk and violence? Did my daughter Griselda and Dominus ask you if the park was a father park, uh, park father Magnabo was a high risk park or a violence park? Did they ask you that the way you're making your questions right now? No, because you were supposed to protect them. And in your Bible, have you already read where it says, Thou shall not kill? Have you? They didn't deserve this, Griselda or Dominic. We'll always, we'll always be missed from birthdays, holidays, special occasions, graduations, Jadens. You will not have a mom to be there. I hope that every time you close your eyes, you see Griselda and Dominic fighting for their lives. I will forever hold Griselda and Dominic close to my heart. Will there nobody, nobody will hurt them ever again. And, I, and now forever, they shall live with me in my heart. All because of you, all that decision that you made. You didn't want to pay child support, right? Well, guess what? Now nobody's going to pay you. 
while you'll be working for free. I love you, Gray and Dominic. Mama loves you. You ambushed my nephew and my sister. You thought you were gonna go get, going to get away with it, didn't you? No doubt you hurt my, our family. Now it's time for your family to cry for you and miss you because you will be in prison. My sister and my nephew's souls will live forever. My father taught me that a man takes care of his responsibilities no matter the situation. I'm guessing your father didn't teach you how to be a man. You will be forgotten like yesterday's newspaper after today. It pleases me knowing that for the rest of your pathetic, miserable life, you will be missing all of your family gatherings while being locked in a cell, thinking of what you did. Coward. Now you want to study the Bible and act like you found God? After this, session is, after this court session is done, I'm going with my family to go have a nice dinner with our loved ones around the table while you eat alone in your cell wishing you can go home. Goodbye, coward. Thank you. Members of the jury, you may uh, follow Mr. Rubio into the jury room. statements and then like goodbye coward Whew. officers you may take the defendant this court will stand in recess thank you all very much <laughs>